Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session, looking at some things by Lydgate. Um, we are doing the last, or, or pretty much the last. I always say the last, you know, I, I can never be certain. Some other random theatrical, semi-theatrical piece of writing will turn up. But we're into our last sessions looking at medieval material for the first time. It's a bit sad. Um... Lydgate wrote a number of things uh, which may or may not be particularly theatrical in the way they've come to us today. Uh, iterations of disguisings, uh, entries, uh, triumphal entries and uh, and other things. We, in fact, we're going to start with something that's quite thingy uh, that we're not quite sure what the thing is. Um, but it could be certain things and we'll find out what the text gives us. Um, Normally we're saying, you know, how would we stage these things today? Uh, most of these documents are not really translatable into actual performance uh, beyond just reading the text. Um, and some of the texts have, shall we say, some some minor problems with being horrifically misogynistic. So content warning there. Um, very much a chap of his time here, uh, Lydgate. Um, yeah, we're going to find out... Um, some of the things he's uh, he's he's written here. Uh, so uh, to read and discover these exciting, innovating moral uh, lessons uh, uh, is in the room. We have Eric. Introduce yourself to the room. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm here in the void, as you can see. Welcome to my domain. Uh, and Liza, introduce yourself to the room, please. Hi, Liza in London. When you gaze at the Liza, the Liza gazes also at you. Uh, Rachel, introduce yourself to the room, please. Rachel, uh, actor on the East Coast. Terrible that you can only be a witch or eaten at this time as a woman. Uh, and um, the context for that statement may make a little more sense in about five minutes' time. And uh, Angela, introduce yourself. Hello, Angela in London, early modernist and thus very uncomfortable with the 15th century. <laughs> yes, uh, and I'm your host, Robert Crichton. Uh, I will attempt to uh, guide you through uh, these texts that I don't know particularly well. We have lightly modernised uh, the, the, the text, which means that anything that is super old fashioned has been left as it was. Uh, and so there'll be lots of things where it's basically say what you see and hope for the best. We're only here really to get a general idea of things, not to uh, uh, to go full on um, medieval with it. So first text in the offing of uh, Shivash and Bikorn. Um And uh, we don't know how theatrical this is supposed to be. This might just be... Uh, as described in the uh, introductory uh, paragraph, um, a a device or for a uh, of of a painted or disdained cloth for a hall. So this may not be theatrical, but it has a sort of theatricality to it in the sense that it is suggesting images as well as um, a text to go with the images. So maybe this is more a comic strip than it is uh, uh, it is a performance piece, but uh, it is a nice little step into the text. I'm going to ask Liza if you can read the introductory paragraphs in between this, uh, the sort of italicised stuff. Uh, Angela, if you could be uh, Bicorn, Bicorn. And Eric, if you can be men and... Uh, uh, I'll and, do my best. And I'll pass additional parts on as we go. Uh, Liza, you can be a woman. And Rachel, you can be Shivash, if that is how we pronounce it. It could be pronounced uh, Chikivache. Um, but I don't think that's right. So we'll saunter through. I'll pass additional parts as we go. Lo, sirs, the device of a painted or disdained cloth of an hall, a parlour or a chamber devised by John Lydgate at the request of a worthy citizen of London. First, there shall hang an image in poet-wise, saying these three ballads. O oh, prudent folks, taketh heed and remembereth in your lives how this story doth proceed of the husbands and their wives, of their accord and of their strives with life or death, which to derain is granted to these beasts twain. And then shall there be portrayed two beasts, one fat, another lean. 
of Chichavash and of Bikorn treateth wholly this mat matter, whose story hath taught us here to forn, how that these beasts, both in fear, have their pasture, as ye shall hear, of men and women in sentence, through sufferance or through impatience. For this bicorn of his nature will none other men or food but patient men in his pasture, and Shishavash eateth women good. And both these beasts by the rood be fat or lean, it may not fail, like lack or plenty of their vitale. Then shall there be portrayed a fat beast called Bicorn of the country of Bicornis, and same these three ballads following. Of Bicornis I am Bicorn, full fat and round here as I stand, and in marriage bond and sworn to Shishevaj as her husband, which will not eat on sea nor land, but patient wives debonair, which to her husband's boon not contraire. Full scarce, God wot, is her betale, humble wise she findeth so few, for always at the country tale their tongue clappeth and doth hew. Such meek wives I beshrew, that neither cane at bed nay board, their husbands nought forbear on word. But my food and my cherishing, to tell plainly and not tarry, is of such folk which their living dare to their wives be not contrary. Nay, from their lusts dare not vary, nor with them hold no shum party, as such my stomach will defy. Then shall be portrayed a company of men coming towards this beast, Bicorn, and say these four ballads. Fellows, taketh heed, and ye may see how Bicorn casteth him to devour all humble men, both you and me. There is no gain us may succor. Woe be, therefore, in hall and bower to all these husbands which their lives make and mistresses of their wives. Who that so doth, this is the law, that this Bicorn will him oppress and devour in his maw that of his wife maketh his mistress. This will us in great dis bring in great distress, for we, for our humility of bygone, shall devoured be. We stand in plainly in such case that they to us mistresses be. We may well sing and say, it, alas, that we gave them the sovereignty, for we be thrall and they be free. Wherefore, bygone, this cruel beast will us devour not the least. But who can that be sovereign and his wife teach and chastise that she dare not a word gainsay and not nor disobey no manner wise of such a man I can devise he stand under pro protection from Bicorn's jurisdiction. Then shall uh, there be a woman devoured, portrayed in the mouth of uh, Chichivache, uh, crying to all wives and say this ballad. Ah, noble wives, beeth well where, taketh and sample now by me, or else affirm well I dare, ye shall be dead, ye shall not flee. Beeth crabbed, beeth crabbed, voideth humility, or Chichavash nay will not fail you for to swallow in her entrail. Ah. Then shall there be there portrayed a long horned beast slender and lean with sharp teeth and on his body nothing save skin and bone chichevache this is my name hungry meager slender and lean to show my body i have great shame for hunger i feel so great teen on me no fatness will be seen because that pasture i find none Therefore I am but skin and bone. For my feeding in existence is of women that be in meek. And like Griseld in patience or more, their bounty for to eke. But I full long may goon and seek, for I can find a good repast, a morrow to break with my fast. I trow there be a dear year of patient women now these days who grieveth them with word or cheer, let him beware of such assays. 
for it is more than 30 maize that I have sought from land to land, but yet one Griselde never I've found. I found but one in all my life, and she was deed sith go full yore, for more pasture I will not strive, nor seech for my food no more, nay for victual me to instore. Women be in waxen so prudent, they will no more be impatient. Then shall there be portrayed after Shivash an old man with a bastard on his back, menacing the beast for the rescouring of his wife. Uh, for rescuing of his wife? Uh, rescuing of his wife? I, I think rescuing. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yes, so he's uh, got a big club. Uh, Liza, be the old man, please. My wife, alas, devoured is, most patient and most peaceable. She never said to me amiss whom now hath slain this beast horrible. And for it is an impossible to find ever such a wife, I will live soul during my life. For now, of new for their prow, the wives of full high prudence have of ascent made their avow for to exile patience and cry wolf's head obedience, and make Chishavash fail of them to find more vitail. Now Chishavash may fast long and die for all their cruelty. Women have made themselves so strong for to outray humility. Oh, silly husbands, woe be on ye, such as can have no patience against your wives' violence. If that ye suffer, ye be but dead, this bicorn awaiteth you so sore, eke of your wives you stand in dread if you gainsay them any more. And thus you stand, and have done your, of life and death betwixt and twain, linked in a double chain. And so ends that uh, 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 that uh, public service broadcast. Um, I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, someone commissioned this, a worthy citizen decided to, uh, asked John Lidgate to devise this um, uh, as, as say, it, it seems to be devised as a sort of comic strip um, tapestry thing um, uh, where, with these, uh, potentially this dialogue effectively to go with it. Maybe the, the dialogue is just there to add uh, an idea of what's going on there for the artist to produce the work itself. You know, is it like the script for a comic book before the comic book is actually uh, the artist actually does the uh, the, the drawing? Um, there are other texts like this. I'm sure I've stumbled across a Thomas More sort of pageant of uh, of images as well. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of interested in this because it's actually very performing. Um, I mean, it's obviously a horrible sentiment, but um, it was um, it it it's have. It, bounced along in uh, in, in a uh, interesting way. Thoughts from the room, Rachel, then Eric. I wonder if we get our dumb shows from this, if this is uh, where that's coming from, because there's so much that uh, seems similar to that in this like shadow puppetry that seems to be going on. Hmm. Yeah, um, but the, 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 is, 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 there, is there more to this than uh, than I know of? I remember, this is also, you know, I, I, I don't know very much about this text at all, so it's, it's I should, I'm stumbling in the dark. But yeah, that's a really interesting thought. Eric, then Liza. Based on the description of the bicorn and, you know, the, the, the terrible beast, I keep picturing the gruffalo, but I don't think that's... <laughs> I don't think that's what it looks like at all. Um... Yeah. I, I, yeah, I can go with that. I can go. With that. I mean, there are an awful lot of, um, as uh, uh, I think Angela was saying before we went along, you know, just doing a quick Google and you you find an awful lot of images of this kind of thing. There's a lot of creatures uh, that have been created around this. Uh, Liza. Yeah, I mean, this from all from the different descriptions of the scenes, it sounds like a series of paintings. Mm or painted cloths rather than a single one, mm. which does make it something, if we take it at face value, very much like a comic. Um, and it would also, I think it would be a really good kind of science fiction-y prompt for a play, because if you have two monsters and one eats good husbands and one eats good wives, then, um, 
you have a whole civilization where people have to be terrible to each other or face death. They've, they've created a situation in which no resolution is possible. Um, so it would be fun to read stories set in this universe. Yeah, uh, you know, working from the position that this is not a good thing, where as opposed to this situ this 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 text, which is saying uh, that um, you know, uh, which is making a uh, a misogynistic point. Um, but yeah, as a setup, that's really interesting. Actually, yeah, I like that idea, and it does it, the language of it all. I mean, um, does sort of feel a bit like a, a more simplistic kind of uh, uh, comic strip. Um, not in the graphic novel stream. I think I think we're uh, thinking in something uh, a bit simpler. Um, okay, I, I don't know if there's any more to say about that because to a degree it's out slightly outside our wheelhouse but a very interesting uh, thing and an interesting bit of context of course uh, an early version of the uh, uh, iterating the story of Griseld um, who we have encountered in dramatic literature later on and will again uh, in the future so um, we're going to dive now into a disguising um, and uh, yes, this is uh, it's put to the king, so uh, some noble patronage here. And um, I'm gonna assume it's Henry the Sixth, but I could be wrong. Um, and yes, uh, this is at Hatford, and uh, we're gonna find out what this is all about. We're gonna dance. I'm just gonna basically hand round the uh, the the various stanzas. Uh, one at a time uh, to go round. Uh, so we'll just go around the room and I'll just uh, indicate who to read next as we go. Um, but uh, we'll probably go Liza, Angela, Eric, Rachel, but I may change that or forget. And we'll see how it goes. So, uh, disguising at uh, Hatford. Now followeth here the manner of a bill by way of supplication put to the king holding his noble feast of Christmas in the castle of Hatford as in a disguising of the rude uplandish people complaining on their wives. A theme is emerging, with the boisterous answer of their wives devised by Lydgate at the request of the country roller Bry's slain at Lavoyers. Okay, there's a bit of background there to look into, of which I have not done. Anyway, Liza, kick us off with uh, the introductory... Uh, remarks. Most noble prince, with support of your grace, there be an entered into your royal place, and lady common into your castell, your poor lieges, which like nothing well. Now in the vigil of this new year, certain swains full froward of their cheer of intent Cummin fallen on their knee for to complain unto your majesty upon the mischief of great adversity, upon the trouble and the cruelty of which that they have endured in their lives by the fellness of their fierce wives, which is a torment very importable, a bond of sorrow and not unremuable. For who is bound or locked in marriage, if he be old, he falleth in dotage, and young folks of their limbs slender, green and lusty, and of brawn but tender. Philosophers call him in such age a child to wive, a woodness or a rage, for they affirm that there is none earthly strife may be compared to wedding of a wife. And who that ever standeth in the case, he with his rebeck may sing full oft, Alas! And uh, at this point, the uh, speaker indicates uh, six rustics, and Angela can take up the, uh, the text. Like as these hinds here standing one by one, he may with them upon the dance gone, learn the trass, both at even and morrow, of carry canto in torment and in sorrow. Wail the while, alas, that he was born, for ob the reeve, there goeth here all to fawn. He plaineth sore his marriage is not meet, for his wife, Beatrice, bittersweet, cast upon him as ugly cheer full row, when he cometh home full weary from the plough, with hungry stomach, Deed and pale of cheer, in hope to find ready his dinner. Then sitteth Beatrice, bawling at the nail, as she that giveth of him no manner tale. For she all day with her jowsy knoll hath for the colic 
hooked in the bowl, and for headache with pepper and ginger, drunk doled ale to make her throat clear, and come at her home when it draweth to Eve, and then Robin, the silly poor Reeve, find none amends of harem nay damage, but lean growl and suppeth cold pottage. And of his wife hath none other cheer but cock unto his supper. This is his service sitting at the board, and silly Robin, if he speak a word, Beatrice of him doth so little wreck that with her distaff she hitteth him in the neck for a medicine to chaff with his blood with such a meteorid she hath shape him and hood. And the uh, speaker then shows a cobbler who Eric will expound upon. And Colin Cobbler, following his fellow, and his, had, ha, hath had his part of the same law, for by the faith that the priest him gave, his wife hath taught him to plane at the staff. Her quarter stroke were so large and round that on his rig the touch was always found. Silly, silly sour cheer, his own precious spouse could him reheat when he came to house if he ought spake when he felt pain again one word when he uh, again one word always he had twain she quit him ever there was no thing to see six for one of word and strokes each there was no mean between them for to gone whatever he won clouting old stone the weekday plainly this is no tale she would on sundays drink at it's at the nail. His part was none. He said not any's nay. He, it was no game, but an earnest play. For lack of wit, a man his wife to grieve. His husband men who so would them leave would could if they durst in tell in audience what followeth them thereof their wives to do offence. Is none is none so old nay rivelled on her face with tongue or staff, but that she dare manace. Mabel, God save her and bless, if could if her list bear here off witness. Words, strokes, unhap and hard grace with sharp nails scratching in the face. I mean thus, when the distaff is broke, with their wives, with their fists, wives will be rogue. Bless the men that came in such offence, meekly suffer cake, call impatience. Didn't you are such wifely purgatory? Heaven for their meat to reign there in glory. God grant all husbands that have been in this place to win so heaven for his holy grace. And uh, the next person to be demonstrated is a butcher. Rachel, take up the cudgels. Next in order, this butcher stout and bold that killed hath bulls and boars old. This Bartholomew, for all his brood knife, yet durst he never with his sturdy wife in no matter hold chomparty. And if he did, she would anon defy his pomp, his pride, with a stern thought, and suddenly set in him at naught. Though his belly were rounded like an oak, she would not fail to give the first stroke. Her proud Purnell, like a champion, would leave her puddings in a great cal cauldron, suffer them boil, and take of them none heed but with her schoomer reach him on the heave. She would pay him and make no delay, bid him go play him a twenty devil way. She was no coward if found at such a need, her fist full oft made his cheeks bleed. What quarrel ever that he against her set, she cast her not to die in, in his debt. She made no tale, but quit him by and by. His quarter sold, she paid him faithfully, and his wages, with all her best intent, she made thereof none assignment. And now we have the uh, the, the showing of the tinker. Liza, take up the uh, the text. Eek Tom Tinker, with all his pans old, and all the wares of Banbury that he sold, his stiff, his hammer, his bag portative, 
bear up his arm when he fought with his wife. He found for haste no better buckler upon his cheek than distaff came so near. Her name was Clepid Tibbet Tapster. To brawl and broil she had no manner fear. To thack his pilch, stoned a male now and then, thicker than Tom could clout in any pan. Uh, next, call Tyler, full heavy of his cheer, complaineth on Felice, his wife, the waferer. All his bread with sugar is not bake, yet on his cheek sometime he hath a cake so hot and new, ere he can take and heed that his hairs glow very red. For medicine, when the, for when the forced is cold, making his teeth to rattle that be an old. This is the complaint that these dotards old make on their wives that been so stout and bold. These holy martyrs, proved full patient, lowly beseeching in all their best intent unto your noble royal majesty to grant them franchise and also liberty. Sith they beeth fettered and bounden in marriage, a, a safe conduct to save them from damage. Eke under support of your high renown, grant them also a protection. Conquest of wives is run through this land, claiming of right to have the higher hand. But if you list of your regali, the Old Testament for to uh, modify, and that ye list assail in their request that these poor husbands might live in rest, and that their wives in their fell might will meddle among mercy with their right. For it came never of nature nay reason a lioness to oppress the lion, nor a wolfess for all her tyranny over the wolf to have in the mastery. There be now wolfesses more than two or three, the books record, which that yonder be. And at this point enter wives, continue for a moment, Liza. Sith to this matter of mercy and of gr seeth to this matter of mercy and of grace and or these dotards part out of this place upon their complaint to shape remedy or they be like to stand in jeopardy it is no game with wives for to play but for fools that give no force to die and uh, now taketh heed of the answer of the wives so uh angela if you could be all of the wives to all of these people because it's a it's a very balanced even debate <laughs> touching the substance of this high discord we six wives been full of one accord if word and chiding may us not avail we will dar in it shamp shamp clues by battle Jupart our right, late or else wrath, and for our party, the worthy wife of Bath, can show statutes more than six or seven how wives make their husbands win heaven. Morgray the filmed uh, with all and all his violence for their virtue of perfect patience parteneth not to wives nowadays, save on their husbands for to make assays. Their patience was buried long ago. Gris <coughs> Grisel's story recordeth plainly so. It longeth to us to clappen as a mile. No counsel keep, but the truth out tell. We be not born by, by heavenly influence of our nature to keep us in silence. For this is no... <coughs> <coughs> For this is no doubt... Every prudent wife hath ready answer in all such manner strife. Though these dotards with their docked beards, which strouteth out as they were made of herds, have again has a great quarrel now set. I trow the bacon was never of them fet. Away at Dunmo at the, in the priory, they ween of us to have a the mastery. Alas, these fools, let them answer here too. Who can them wash? Who can them ring also? Ring them, yea, ring, so ask God, send God us speed. Till that sometime we make her noses bleed, and sew her clothes when they both torrent, and clout their backs till some of us be shent. Lo, yet these fools, God give them sorry chance, would set her wives under governance. 
make us to them for to loud to low. We know too well the bent of Jack's bow. All that we claim, we claim it but of right. If they say nay, let prove it out by fight. We will as ground not upon woman head, fie on them cowards. When it cometh to need, we claim mastery by prescription, be long title of succession. From wife to wife, which we will not lease, men may well grucheck, grush, but they shall not cheese. Custom is us for nature and usance to set our husband's life in great noisance. Humbly beseeching now at one word unto our liege and most sovereign lord us to defend of his regally and of his grace sustain our party, requiring the statute of old antiquity that in your time it may confirmed be. And the complaint of the lewd husbands with the cruel answers, I'm just reading the words here, of their wives heard, the king giveth thereupon sentence and judgment. Uh, Eric, would you like to be the king? I thought I already was. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 maybe that's a gap for the, uh, the, the king rather than this is actually dialogue for the king. Uh, so By maybe the, way... the king... King makes judgment and then this speech happens. Sorry, Liza. The word in bold is I. I, yes. Anyway, Eric, let's find out who this speech is. This noble prince, most royal of his state, having an eye to this moral, m mortal debate, uh, first adverting of full high prudence, will unadvised give here no sentence, without counsel of haste to proceed by sudden doom. For he Talketh he, taketh heed to either party as judge indifferent, seeing the peril of hasty judgment, purposeth him in this continued strife to give no sentence thereof definitive till there be made examination of other party and in inquisition. He considereth and maketh reason his guide as evil judge, inclining to no side, notwithstanding he hath compassion of the poor husband's tribulation, so oft arrested with their wives' rocks, which of their distaves have so many knocks, facing also in his regally the law that women allege for their party, costume, nature, and eke prescription, statute used by confirmation, process and the date of time out of mind, record of chronicles witness of her kind, wherefore, wherefore the king, Will all this next year that wives franchise stand whole and entire, and that no man withstand it nay withdraw till man may find some process out by law that they should by nature in their lives have sovereignty on their prudent wives, that thing uncouth which was never found, that men beware that they are for or they be bound, the bond is hard, so that looketh well. Some man were lever fettered. Even in steel, ransom might his might ransom might help his pain to assuage. But who is wedded liveth ever in service, and I know never nowhere far near near man that was glad to him to bind that man that was glad to bind to him prisoner, though that his prison, his castle, or his hold were depainted with azure or with gold. We cannot hear you, oh, fearless leader. You are muted. <laughs> I was saying such wonderful words, um, and, and you missed them all. Uh, so, yes, thus the text ends. And, um, yes, did uh, even with uh, taking into account the royal we, did we feel that that was a sort of royally kind of text or uh, or not? It was a weird one. I wasn't quite sure. Whether the king had made a judgment and then this was just a sort of summing up afterwards of that kind of thing. I, I don't quite, you know. How do we feel about that? It was weird. I don't... Angela. No, I, think, I mean, I read that sentence. The king giveth thereupon sentence and judgment. So this is the prince talking. Mm. And then he said, and, and he seems to say, the wives win it. 
So, uh, so uh, we can we can infer that the uh, Lydgate handed this to the king, and uh, uh, or or someone pretending to be the king. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of liking the idea that the king had to learn that. <laughs> I don't imagine that would have ever have happened. Um, but yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, okay, so it's a very balanced debate, as we can tell. Um, it was uh, not one sided at all, and um, yeah. It was some um, uh, an ongoing list of uh, uh, people being beaten by their their their, their terrible, horrible wives, um, which I'm sure was hilarious. Well, at least the wives got to say something. I quite liked that speech. Mm. Yes. How did we find the wives' repost, as it were? I and found it hard. Yes. <laughs> But, but I, I, I mean, it seems to be saying, you know, there's no point going around being patient. You know, these idiots, they can't do any of the things we can do. So they just deserve to be treated badly because they're just so hopeless. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, if you took it out, out of the framework of the rest of the text, um, there's, there's quite a lot of, um, uh, of, of, of good stuff in there. Um, <laughs> it's just unfortunately it's framed by a load of other stuff. Uh, Rachel. Uh, the part where he asks about changing the actual like Bible to say to say different things and to, I mean, uh, even though it's in the context of this that to use religion for the points that they believe it should make like socially or something like how over the years certain parts of the Bible or whatever have been. Um, purposely misconstrued to fit more with the social mores of the time in which it gets retranslated or republished i don't, I don't know i yeah i was forgetting which character or which character on behalf of which character said that bit because i can't find it, it was the husbands they yeah. asked him if he would if he would change the law from the old testament which which is the law about good wives mm. So in the Old Testament, there is a whole passage about the good wife and the good wife, you know, she gets up before anybody else has got up and she makes all the food and she does everything, you know, so that she is this, she is this paragon, this good wife who spends her whole life serving her family. And I, I think that, you know, so they're saying, well, I don't understand. Right. So this is why I don't understand is why are the husbands saying, do you want to change it? Because surely they want it not to be changed. They want it to be the way it should be. Mm. So I, I was a bit puzzled about that. Mm. We don't have to come up with all the answers now. Uh, I'm just saying. But it's a really good question to, to be uh, bringing up. Um, so, um, uh, Rachel. Or are you just is your hand just sort of... You're just testing the thickness of the air. Yeah. Oh, no. I think that uh, the 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 I think they're asking for it to be changed because they say that if you uh, listen by assailant, do they mean like from like they're assailing, like sieging a, a castle or something, or their ears that they might hear the end of it? I think is what that means if he changes the actual Bible to um, a. In Middle English, to assail or assail, it means to absolve, I think. Hmm. But I mean, there, there, there's a sort of crossover meaning in the sense of, um, you know, give in to their request. I think that's where in this context, yeah. that's what it means. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's the Rachel's logic is, is, is sound. I think it is that sense of if we make the thing in the Old Testament slightly less extreme, then and we have a slightly more equitable thing, then maybe we will not have quite so much uh, complaining going on in our general direction. It, that might be the logic if we, but um, I don't know. I don't know. Again, it doesn't seem wholly unreasonable as a, as a, as a, as a point of view, but um, uh, Angela and then uh, Rachel. Sorry. Sorry, Rach. So, well, I mean, I was just going to say that in the, in the, um, in the Prince's response, he, he takes his authority or claims that the wives are taking their authority, not from the Bible, but from custom 
out of mind. And this is, this is in fact, right, this is a legal phrase and it's about how, uh, you know, so for, for example, people would claim that they had the right to farm a particular piece of land because they had done so custom out of mind. All right. So in other words, there's a long memory of that happening because, of course, written records are, are less. So it's kind of interesting that he's saying since this has become the custom, custom out of mind, then then it needs to stick with the custom. That's how I'm understanding this might be horribly wrong but it was really interesting to see those phrases because i recognize those you know from kind of like social history and everything okay well we're going to have to move for on to the next disguising uh this next entertainment uh being made and uh this might be slight and actually just uh, just to go back to rachel's point earlier about the dumb show element um of the last one in this one it it's very much that kind of thing there's there's obviously a visual thing going on with a narrator or this has been slightly rewritten um to just describe things which were more dramatic um but um it, it's slightly difficult to tell um so yeah there's uh, there's something uh really really interesting there we're going to get more of that as we go into the disguising at london uh, we're safe. still in the early uh, uh, 15th century. Uh, we've had a name, uh, not quite a name check, but we've had a, 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 a Chaucer check. So it's always nice to uh, uh, make sure that people are, are, are mentioning each other. Um, uh, but um, a bit past uh, uh, that. Uh, anyway, disguising at London. Lo, here followeth the device of a disguising to for the greatest states of this land. Then being at London, made by Lydgate, uh, Don John, the Monk of Berry, and that's Berry St. Edmunds, um, by Dame Fortune, Dame Prudence, Dame Rightwiseness, and Dame Fortudito, uh, Fortitudo, uh, beholdeth, for it is moral, pleasant, and notable. So, uh, lo, first cometh in Dame Fortune. Uh, Rachel, would you care to be Dame Fortune, please? Lo, here this lady that ye may see, lady of mutability, which that called is Fortune, for seldom one she doth contune. For as she hath a double face, right so every hour and space she changeth her conditions. I full of transmutations, like as the Romans of the rose describe, describeth her without in gloss and telleth plain how that she hath her dwelling in the sea, joining to a barren rock. And on that one side doth approach a little mountain like an isle, upon which land some while, there growing fresh flowers new. Wonder lusty of their hue, diverse trees with fruit elayed, and brides with their notes glad, that singin' and makin' melody in their heavenly harmony, some sing on high and some low. And Zephyrus there doth eke blow with his smooth, a temporary air, a temporary air. He maketh the weather clear and fair, and the season full of grace. But suddenly, in little space, upon this place most royal, there cometh a wave, and fore doth all. First the fresh flowers glad, on their stalks he doth fad, to their beauty he doth wrong. And then farewell the bride's song, branch and bough of every tree, she robbeth them of her beauty leaf and blossoms down they fall and in that place she hath an all departed and wonder disguisey from that one side ye may see curiously wrought for the nons of gold of silver and of stones whose riches may not be told but that other side of that hold is ye built in ugly wise and ruinous for to devise. Daubed of clay is that dungeon, I in point to fall adown. That one fair by apparence, and that other in existence, shaken with winds, rain and hail. And suddenly there doth assail a rage flood that mansion, and overfloweth it up and down. Here is no rescuse, 
here is no rescues, ne'er obstacle of this lady's habitacle. And as her house is, I unstable, right? So herself is deceivable. In one point, she is never alike. This day, she maketh the man all rich and through her mutability, casteth him tomorrow in poverty. The proudest she can give a fall. She made Alexander win an all that nomen him with stoned dare and cased him down ere he was where. So did she Caesar Julius. She made him first victorious, though to do well she be full loath. Of a baker's son in sooth, she made him a mighty emperor and whole of Rome was governor. Mulgri, the Senate and all their might. But when the sun shone most bright of his triumph, far and near, and he was crowned with laurier, unwarily though through her mortal law, with bodkins he was a slaw at the capital in consistory. Lo, after all his great victory. See how this lady can appall the nobly say of these princes all. She hath two tons in her cellar, that one is full of pigment clear, confit with sugar and spices suit, swoot, and many delectable root. But this is yet the worst of all, that other ton is full of gall. Who tasteth one, there is none other. He must taste eke of that t'other, whose sudden changes be not soft. For now she can raise one aloft from low estate till high degree. In old stories ye may see estates change, who taketh keep. For one guides that kept cheap, she made by virtue of a ring, for to be made a worthy king. And by false murder, I dare express, he came to all his worthiness, most odious of all things, and Croesus richest ache of kings, was so circuitous, so circuitous in his pride that he went upon no side, none earthly thing might him perturb, nor his royal estate disturb, till on a night a dream he met, how Juno in the air him set, and Jupiter, he understands, gave him water unto his hands, and Phoebus held him the to wail. But of this dream, the divinale his daughter gain to specify and far to form to prophesy, which called was Leroy, Leroyope. She said he should and hanged be. This was her exposition. Lo, how his pride was brought down. In all these changes, if they be sought, this false lady hath them wrought. Availed with their sudden showers, the worthiness of conquerors, read of poets, the comedies, and in, a, in, in diver, diverse tragedies, ye shall by lamentations find in their destructions a thousand more than I can tell into mischief how they fell down from her wheel on sea and land. Therefore, her malice to withstand, her pomp, her sir quiddy her pride if she will a while abide for ladies shall come here and on which shall her power uh, overgone and the malice eke oppress of this blind false goddess if she be hardy in this place once for to show her double face now cometh here the first lady of the four dame prudence lizard uh, be prudent please Lo, here this lady in your presence of poets called is Dame Prudence, the which with her mirror bright by the purveyance of her foresight and her mirror called Providence is strong to make resistance in her foresight as it is right against fortune and all her might. For Senec saith who that can see that Prudence hath iron three specially in her lookings to consider three manner things always by good advisement 
things past and things present, and things after that shall fall. And she mote look first of all, and do in her inward busy pain things present for to ordain advisedly on every side, and future things for to provide, the things past in substance for to have in remembrance. And who thus doth I say that he verily hath I in three committed unto his defence the true mirror of providence? Then this lady is his guide, him to defend on every side against fortune good and perverse, and all her power for to reverse. For franchised and at liberty, from her power to go free, stand all folks in sentence, which been governed by prudence. And now showeth her here the second lady, Dame Right Wiseness. Angela, if you could uh, be right wise, please. Seeth here this lady, Right Wiseness. Of all virtues, she is princess. For by the scales of her balances, she set all, them all in governances. She put it aside, it is no dread. Friendship, favour, and all kins mead. Love and dread she setteth at naught, for rightful doom may not be bought. And right wiseness, who can espy, hath neither hand nor eye. She lost her hand, full is your agone, for she receiveth gifts none, neither of friend, neither of foe. And she hath lost her sight also, for of right she doth provide naught for to look on neither side, to high estate nor lower degree, but doth to bothen all equity, and maketh none exception to neither part but of reason. And for the purpose of this matter, of a judge ye shall hear, which never his life of intent there passed no judgment by his lips of falseness of whom the story doth express after his death by accounts clear more than three hundredth year his body as is made mention was turned into corruption the story telleth it is no dread but like a rose sweet and red mouth and lips were he found not corrupt but whole and sound for truth is that he did express in all his dooms of right wiseness for this lady with these balance was with him of acquaintance which him made in his intents to give all rightwise judgments wherefore this lady which ye here see with her balances of equity hath the scales hanged so that she hath no thing to do never with fortune's doubleness for ever in one stant rightwiseness Nowhere moving to nay fro is no thing that she hath to do. Lo, here cometh in now the third lady called Fortitudo. And Eric, if you could be the third lady, please. Take thee heed, this fair lady, lo, I call this Fortitudo, whom philosophers by their sentence are warned to cleep magnif magnificence. And fortitude is soothly she hide against all vices for to fight, confirmed as by surety against all adversity, in sign whereof she beareth a sword that she of nothing is feared, for common profit also she of very magnanimity, things great doth under fong, taking emprises which have been strong, and most she doth her power prove a commonality for to relieve. Namely, upon a ground of truth, then, then, namely, upon wait, no, namely, upon a ground of truth, then in her there is no sloth for to maintain the good common, and all the salts of fortune, a very steadfastness of thought, all her changes she set at naught. For this virtue, magnificence, through thor thorough her mighty excellence, she armed these philosophers old of worldly thing that they not told record upon diogenes on plato and on socrates she made cypri cypion of carthage to under in his age for common profit things great and 
for no dread list not let against Rome, that mighty town, for to defend his region. She made Hector for his city despair for non adversity. But as a mighty champion in the defense of Troy's town, to die without in fear or dread. And thus, this lady who taketh heed maketh her champions strong, perilous things to underfong till that they their purpose find. Record of the worthy nine of other eke that were but late. I mean, princes of later date, Harry the Fifth, I dare say so. He might be told for one of those eh, emprises which were that begone, he left not till they were won. And I suppose, and you list see that these ladies, all three, were of his counsel, doubtless. Force, prudence, and right wiseness of these three, he took his route to put fortune underfoot. And sith this lady in virtue strong, sustaineth truth and doth not wrong. Let her now to more and less be welcome to you this Christmas. And the easy done cometh in the fourth lady, clipped fair dame and wise a temperance. Uh, Rachel, can you be wise? We'll see. This fourth lady that ye seen here, humble, debonair, and sad of cheer, I called is a temperance to set all thing in governance and for her sisters to provide. Vices all shall circumcede and set in them in stableness. With her cousin soberness, she shall from vices then restrain and in virtue hold her reign and therein give them liberty, eschewing all dishonesty and them enforming by prudence. For to have patience, lowness, and humility, and pride specially to flee. Continence from gluttony, eschew dishonest company, flee in the dice and the tavern, and in soberness them govern, with heart all that ever they can, in virtue love in every man. Say the best I of intent, who that seeth well doth not repent. Detraction and gluttony, Void them from thy company, and all rancor set aside. Be not too hasty, but ever abide, specially to done vengeance. In abode is no repentance, and in virtue who is thus set, there be these sisters well met. And soothly, if it can, if it be discerned, who by these four is thus governed? Thus I mean that by prudence he have the mirror of providence. For to consider things all, namely perils ere they fall, and to that have by governance of right wiseness the balance, and strongly hold in his defense the sword of her magnificence, yea, been assured from all mischance, namely when that a temperance her sister governeth all three. From fortune ye may then go free, both all way in heart and thought. While ye be so, nay dread her not, but avoideth her acquaintance for her double variance, and fleeth out of her company and all that been of her alley. And ye four sisters, glad of cheer, shall abide here all this year in this household at liberty, and joy and all prosperity with you to household ye shall bring. And ye all four shall now sing with all your whole heart entire some new song about the fire, such one as you liketh, liketh best. Let fortune go play her where her list. Merry Christmas. Um, so, yeah, uh, have a sing song. Um, so we have these, uh, these four uh, uh, dames uh, here who are there to help guide you through the 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 the, the fickleness of fortune because you can't guarantee where fortune is going to send you but uh, if you have right wiseness fortitude um prudence and temperance uh, then you uh, you you will you will go far um against the vagaries of fortune's wheel that seemed to be the general moral theme of which we have turns up in various morality plays and uh, other other sort of texts later that we have from later on it definitely is a thing that sort of bounces about um 
Uh, yeah, and another kind of text as well. Any thoughts in the room uh, on these these epic speeches? Again, I, I'm 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 not wholly sold on the idea that the figures themselves are saying this, or whether there's a, someone just standing it to one side, just reciting that these people are there. Um, I'm 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 not wholly sold that they're just talking about themselves in the third person or not. I don't know. Thoughts in the room, uh, Rachel. Um. I mean, this also kind of reminds me of the Lord Mayor's shows where we have all these figures or like a mask or mm -hmm. um, to the, what you said about the figure off to the side saying these as opposed to, you know, the person doing the action. Uh, w was it in the Brazen Age or one of the age plays where the dumb show was happening and somebody, the text narrating the dumb show is right afterwards and that mm -hmm. they would be taking place at the same time? um time mm. yeah oh absolutely and uh, there's a uh, there's a number of dumb shows that do that in later plays absolutely um yeah and because uh, i I'm, I'm not even sure that they're really doing anything they're just doing sort of tableau things they come on and stand there and do it hold, hold a pose um and yeah there's some um, there's all sorts of things like that uh other thoughts before we do actually get to some civic pageantry <laughs> as opposed to private entertainment. Liza. Well, as medieval moral verse goes, I quite like this. I like, you know, it's in places it's very reminiscent of Chaucer. And I think I think Lydgate must have had had Chaucer ready to hand because there have been enough references. Mm. Um, but yeah, I as as explications for laymen of what lay persons of what these virtues are and why they have the attributes that they have which are the attributes they're usually shown with um, I think it works quite well and it communicates its message quite well and paints a very vivid picture hmm. it, it's it's quite useful data to actually be able to say well what are these things and what are their the, what are their sim what's the symbology of these characters well we we, we have that explicated at, at length at some length um uh rachel um so i i think a, a while back I, it's somewhere in our little discord or whatever that i posted those like how when we were doing them the i talked i talked to some academic who you know it does early modern stuff in northern africa and she, you know there were like those merry things that were semi whatever and uh there was something else she said and i don't remember it exactly but that there's whatever this is there's some similarity that around the same period you have this same style uh of storytelling i think popping up uh in northern africa and ethiopia uh maybe or t towards um western north africa as well I, it doesn't really have much to do with this but I don't know, maybe just to put this in an international context of the period. Mm, absolutely. Um, we don't know precisely how much uh, communication uh, across borders there were. For uh, We've got a pretty good idea for the near neighbours, but how, how much is communicated uh, long distance, uh, we do not know. But uh, maybe there are connections. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Henry VI triumphal entry into London. Uh, we've already done uh, a slightly later one, uh, so this is from the 21st of February 1432, and uh, we've we've looked at previously on a previous video uh, Marge Margaret of Anjou entry in, uh, entry into London. This is uh, this is for the king um, uh, over ten years earlier. So, and this might be the earliest civic pageantry that we've done. Uh, I don't know, there may be more uh, uh, other stuff, but I don't think there is. I think this might be our earliest bit of civic pageantry. Um, it's a lot of description um, and some occasional bits of dialogue. Uh, I will do any of the big, chunky bits of dialogue, uh, uh, anything in, in, in chunky stuff in uh, inverted commas, but I will then assign people to step into. There's a lot of embedded dialogue in the uh, long speeches, so to give people a... Uh, a bit of a break uh, I'll step in and read those as well so that uh, you, you you're not doing massively long speeches and I'll I'll pause you every so often and uh, and, and assign a different reader uh, so uh, Liza if you can take the first uh, 
mahusive speech uh, coming up, um, and then uh, uh, well, pass over when we get to some uh, some speeching. Uh, so, ordinances for the king made in the city of London on the 21st of February, 1432. Let's find out what this text gives us for it. Toward the end of windy February, when Phoebus was in the fish he run, out of the sign which call it is a query, new calends were entered and begun of March's coming, and the merry sun upon a Thursday showed his beams bright upon London to make him glad and light. The stormy rain of all their heaviness were passed away and all her old grievance. For the sixth Harry, root of their gladness, their heart's joy, their world's sufficiency, by true descent crowned King of France. The heaven rejoicing the day of his repair made his coming the weather to be so fair. A time, I trow, of God for him provided. In all the heavens there was no cloud seen. For other days that, from other days that day was so divided and franchised from mists and from rain, the air attempered, the winds smooth and plain. The citizens throughout the city hallowed that day with great solemnity, and or hailed that day with great solemnity. And like for David, after his victory rejoiced was all Jerusalem. So this city with laud, prize, and glory for joy mustered like the sunbeam to give example throughout the realm, all of ascent whoso can conceive, their noble king weren't glad to receive. Their clothing was of color, full covenable, the noble mayor, he clad in red velvet, the shrives, the shreves, the aldermen, full notable, in furred cloaks, the color scarlet. In stately wise, when they were met, each one well horsed made no delay, but with their Mary rode forth in their way. The citizens, each one of the city, in their intent that they were pure and clean, chose them of white a full fair livery, in every craft as it was well seen, to show the truth that they did mean toward the king, had made him faithfully in, in sundry devices embroidered richly. And for to uh, and for to remember of other aliens, first Genevas, though they were strangers, Florentines, oh Genoese, first Genoese, though they were strangers, Florentines and the Venetians and Esterlings glad in her manners, conveyed with sergeants and other officers, a stately horse after the mayor riding past the suburbs to meet with the king. To the black heath, when they did attain, the mayor of prudence in especial made them hove in reins twain, a street between each party like a wall, all clad in white and the most principal aforn in red with their mayor riding till time that he saw the king coming. Then with his spurs he took his horse anon, that to behold it was a noble sight. How like a man he to the king is gone, well, right well cheered, of heart glad and light, obeying to him as him ought of right, and after that he cunningly abrayed to the king, even thus he said. Sovereign lord and noble king, ye be welcome out of your realm of France into this your blessed realm of England, and in special unto your most notable city of London, otherwise called your chamber. We thanking God of the good gracious and gracious earning of your crown of France, beseeching his merciful grace to send you prosperity and many years to the comfort of all your loving people. Angela, take up the narrative thrust. But Forto tellen all the circumstances of everything shown in sentence, noble devices, diverse ordinances, conveyed by scripture with full great excellence, all to declare I have none eloquence, wherefore I pray to all that shall it read, for to correct whereas they see need. First, when he passed was the favour uh, entering the bridge of this noble town. There was a pillar raised like a tower, and thereon stood a sturdy champion, of look and cheer stern as a lion. 
his sword upreared, proudly gan menace all foreign enemies from the king to enchase. And in defence of his estate royal, the giant would abide each eventer, and all assaults that were martial, for his sake he proudly would endure, in token whereof he had a scripture on either side declaring his intent, which said thus, by good advisement, All those that be enemies to the king shall them clothe with confusion, make him mighty with virtuous living, his mortal foe to oppression and bear a down, and him to increase as Christ's champion, all mischiefs from him to abridge, with the grace of God at the entering of the bridge. Two antelopes standing on either side with the arms of England and of France, in tokening that God shall for him provide as he hath title by just inheritance, to reign in peace, plenty and pleasance, ceasing of war, that men may ride or go as true lieges, their hearts made both one. Furthermore, so as the king gan ride, mid of the bridge there was a tor on loft, the Lord of Lords being I his guide, as he hath he and yet will be full oft, the tour arrayed with velvet soft, clothes of gold, silk and tapestry, as appertaineth to his regally. And at his coming of excellent beauty, being of port most womanly of cheer, there issued out empresses three. There he displayed as Phoebus in her spear, with crownets of gold and stones clear, at whose outcoming they gave such a light that the beholders were stonied in their star sight. And Eric's going to tell us uh, what uh, each of them were. The first of them was called Nature, as she that hath under her domain man, beast, and fowl, and every creature within the bonds of her golden chain. Eke heaven and earth, and every creature that this empress of costume doth embrace. And next there cometh her sister called Grace, passing famous and of great reverence, most desired in all regions, for where that ever she he, with here presents, she bringeth gladness to cities and towns, of all fair, all where welfare she holdeth the possessions. For I dare say, prosperity is in no place while no while abideth, but if there be grace. In token that grace should be long continued unto the king, she showed higher full benign, and next higher come the empress. Fortune, appearing to him with many a noble sign and royal tokens to show that he was thine of God, who disposes graceless to ordain. Upon his head to were the crowns twain. These three ladies of all intent to nominated present and to non incline what they were plainly to termine great game for his coming two gifts. Be left and every every white fortune gave him eke property and riches with this scripture appearing in their sight to him appealed of very you right shall i keep going or okay uh first understand oh sorry no, 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 I've, I've, I've had a few glitches my end so i apologize i wasn't quite sure where we were first understand and joyfully proceed and long to reign The scripture said indeed this to mean whose understand whoso understand aright that thou shalt be fortune have long prosperity and be nature thou shalt have strength and might and forth to proceed in long felicity and grace also hath granted them to be virtuously in their royal city with scepter and crown to reign in equity and we'll pass on to rachel we find out who's who's with uh, nature grace and fortune 
On the right hand of these empresses stood seven maidens, very celestial. Like Phoebus beams shone their golden tresses upon their heads, each having a cornel of port and cheer, seeming immortal, in sight transcending all earthly creatures, so angelic they were of their figures, all clad in white and taken of cleanness, like pure virgins as in their intents, showing outward an heavenly fresh brightness, streamed with suns were all their garments, a form provided for pure innocence, most columbine of cheer and of looking, meekly roused up at coming of the king. They had an bodrikes all of sapphire hue, going outward gan the king salue, him presenting with her gifts new, like as them thought it was unto them due, which ghostly gifts here in order shoe, sue, down descending as silver dew fro heaven, all grace include within these gifts seven. These royal gifts been a virtue most ghostly courage, courages, most sovereignly delight. These gifts called of the Holy Ghost, outward figured be seven doves white, and saying to him, like as clerks write, God thee fulfill with intelligence and with a spirit of ghostly sapience. God send also unto thy most veil thee to preserve from all heaviness a spirit of strength and of good counsel, of cunning, dread, pity, and lowness. Thus these ladies gan their gifts dress, graciously at their outcoming, by influence light upon the king. These empresses had on their left side other seven virgins, pure and clean, be attendants continually to abide, all clad in white, smiteful of stars sheen, and to declare what they would mean unto the king with full great reverence. These were their gifts shortly in sentence. God thee endure, endue with a crown of glory, and with sceptre of cleanness and pity, and with the sword of might and victory, and with a mantle of prudence clad thou be, a shield of faith for to defend thee, an helm of health wrought to thine increase, girt with a girdle of love and perfect peace. These seven virgins, of sight most heavenly, with heart, body, and hands rejoicing, and of other cheers appeared merely for the king's gracious homecoming, and for gladness they began to sing, most angelic with heavenly harmony, this same rondelle, which I shall now specify. Sovereign Lord, welcome to your city, welcome our joy and our heart's pleasance, welcome our gladness, welcome our sufficience, welcome, welcome, right welcome, Moti B. Singing to form thy royal majesty, we say of heart without variance, Sovereign Lord, welcome, welcome ye be. Mayor, citizens, and all the commonalty, at your home coming now out of France, by grace relieved of their old grievance, sing this day with great solemnity sovereign lord welcome to your city at which point we're just gonna pause um because we're getting all the stuff we've explored at great detail with lord man shows uh in the future um here we've got towers we've got towers with mighty warriors standing on them we've got uh we've got Three empresses, nature, grace, fortune, slightly further away. We've got seven maidens um, uh, in go with golden tresses. And then we've got seven virgins. I don't know if they're different seven virgins or whether they're just reiterating the thing about the seven virgins because I would have thought the seven maidens is quite similar to seven virgins. So I'd, I'd, I don't know if we just have an additional uh, or just a sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, we, we've got a couple of antelopes as well um, and lots of doves. So um, I'm hoping for more animals. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I, I want lots of animals. Uh, Rachel, was it seven virgins and seven maidens, or were they separate people? There's no. There, I think there's seven on the left hand and seven on the right hand. Mm. Uh, uh, oh, I was going to say that this part just reminds me of um, 
uh, that marriage mask that uh, we read of Ben Johnson's, where it's just the purity, 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 not nonsense, uh, something, something about virginity and stuff. Like that long song that he said after the first like four lines, they just cut. <laughs> like, mm. That's what it sounds like. But we, we, you know, we get this uh, nice stuff. It's, it's, uh, you know, of, you know, welcome to your city. It's your city, my lord. You've just come over from France. Uh, you are the king. Uh, isn't that great? Um, I'm, I'm sure H uh, Henry the Sixth reign is going to be nice and quiet and uh, completely uneventful, and he's going to be a great, great king. Uh, this yeah, is the thing. It's... All all of these um, these uh, uh, king king and queen entrances that we've we've we do for the medieval period. It's all in the middle of the Wars of the Roses. It's an it's it, irony. It's not, police though. are coming in. The, Sorry, war, the wars don't properly start until I think the fourteen fifties. Oh yeah, this is fourteen thirty two. He's very young. He, he's ten years old. Mm. But yeah, the irony police for all of these are, is, 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 coming, is coming for us. Historical ironies really, um, really does a number on them. Uh, anyway, we need to move on. Uh, so we go around, uh, around the room again. Liza, if you could uh, pick up. Uh, they, uh, we're going to do some riding into the city, I think. There's, uh, there's a lot more horses going on here. A lot of horse action. Thus received an easy pace riding. The king is entered into this city, and in Cornhill anon at his coming to do pleasance unto his majesty. A tabernacle surmounting of beauty there was ordained by full fresh entail, richly arrayed with royal apparel. This tabernacle of most magnificence was of his building very imperial, made for the lady called Dame Sapience, to for whose face most stately and royal were in the seven sciences called liberal round about, as make it is memory, which never departed from her consistory. First, there was grammar, as I rehearse gan, chief founderess and root of all cunning, which had aforn her old Prician, and logic had aforn her standing Aristotle most clerkly disputing. And rhetoric had eke in her presence Tullius, called the mirror of eloquence. And music had, void of all discord, Boise, her clerk, with heavenly harmony. And instruments all of one accord, for to practice with sugared melody. He and his scholars their wits did apply with touch of strains on organs eke playing. Their craft to show at coming of the king. And arsymmetric by casting of numbery chose Pythagoras for her party, called chief clerk to govern her library. Euclid took measures by craft of geometry, and all their highest stood astronomy. Albunizar last with her of seven, with instruments that wrought up to heaven. The chief princess was called Sapience, had to forn her written this scripture. Kings, quoth she, most of excellence by me they reign and most enjoy endure for through my help and my busy cure to increase their glory and high renown they shall of wisdom have full possession and in the front of this tabernacle sapiens a scripture gan devise able to be read without a spectacle to young kings saying in this wise understandeth and learneth of the wise on right remembering the high lord to quem uh, queen des sith ye be judges other folk to deem furthermore the matter doth devise the king proceeding forth upon his way come to the conduit made in circle wise whom to receive there was made no delay and midst above in full rich array there stood a child of beauty preselling midst of the throne arrayed like a king whom to govern there was figured twain a lady mercy sat on his right side on his left hand if i shall not feign a lady truth his dooms to provide the lady clemency aloft did abide of god ordained in the same place the king's throne strongly to embrace for by the sentence of prudent solomon mercy and right even every king and clemency kept by reason his mighty throne from mischief and falling 
making it and maketh it strong with long abiding for i dare say these said ladies three a king preserve in long prosperity and we'll pass over to angela <clears throat> Then stood also afore the said king two judges with full high noblesse, eight sergeants, each one representing for common profit and doom and right wiseness. With this scripture, which I shall express Honour of kings in every man's sight, of common custom loveth equity and right. King David wrote, The sorter beareth witness. God, uh, Lord God. God he. Thy doom to give the king and give thy truth and thy right wiseness, the king's son here in his living. To us declaring as by their writing that kings, princes, should about them draw folk that be true and well expert in the law. The king forth riding entered cheap anon, a lusty place, a place of all delicacy, Come to the conduit, where, as crystal stone, the water ran like wells of paradise. The wholesome liquor, full rich and of great price, like to the water of Archidecline, which by miracle was turned into wine. Thetes, which, which that is of water's chief goddess, had of the well power noon no might. For Bacchus showed there his fulsomeness of wholesome wines to every manner white. For wine of nature maketh hearts light. Wherefore Bacchus, at reverence of the king, showed out his plenty at his homecoming. Wine is a liquor of recreation. That day presented in token of all gladness unto the king of famous and high renown from us, Texile all manner heaviness. For with his coming the deed beareth witness, out of the land he put away all trouble, and made of new our joys to be double. And we'll just pause there briefly. Um so yeah, we're we're back to places we're recognised now. Um We've got uh, Sapience and Seven Sciences. Um, it's starting to feel like some of those morality plays we do later on, uh, the, the, uh, uh, where, where we've got those these elements coming together. A child with uh, 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 sort of mirroring the king, mercy and truth, judges and sergeants. Um, and we're in a place we know well, Cheapside, uh, with the conduit running with clear lovely water and more importantly liquor um <laughs> this is a great thing about when the king comes they can afford to make the conduits run with wine they've got the budget to make that happen so all of much of this not necessarily all of this this is this is stuff that's happening uh hundreds of years before we're used to looking at it and you know there's a huge amount of continuity here there's there's much more continuity than there is an absence. OK, this is a royal entrance. It's not the same as uh, a Lord Mayor show, but um, there's a lot of similarities here. Uh, any any thoughts to leap in before we go into our final plunge? Uh, Rachel. Um, I don't know. It gives that uh, to what you just said, kind of. It gives that new perspective, I think, for the Lord Mayor shows uh, uh, how um, that I don't know the traditional or how um what is it called or um how how ceremonious it is and how much of an homage it's giving to uh the past of London every time a mayor comes in uh you know like how sometimes they named all the guys who are a part of their company that uh I I don't know that this is supposed that they're supposed to be perhaps evocative of you know welcoming the royalty of your but uh you know letting in a elected official uh other thoughts uh, before we move forward uh liza well i wonder if the lord mayor's uh pageants that we do aren't an attempt to to mimic this uh the cer the ceremony you would have for royalty um I'm certainly enjoying the points where we hit the same geographical places, mm, which yeah. are, are are not all the same, but some. 
Yeah, and you're sort of going, I know where we are. I know where we are. <laughs> <laughs> different tube map, different tube line. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, we will be doing more royal entries as well as we go forward. So we're going to be filling in the gaps of our knowledge base as we go. Uh, Angela. Well, I was just going to, I mean, I don't think that the conduits run with wine for the Lord Mayor's show. It is a very royal thing. So we see that happening every time there's a coronation and like these great entrances. So I'm, I'm so, but I, I wondered then, am I wrong about that? <laughs> so. No, so the, I don't think the budget ever runs to, to the conduits running with wine for the Lord Mayor shows. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain wine is quite available, um, but I don't think in this demonstrative fashion. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, Eric, if you'll take up the uh, the lines from because uh, we're going to meet some more virgins. Uh, here we go. Let's see where uh, where this goes. Eek at these wells, there were virgins three, which drew up, which drew wine up of joy and of pleasance, mercy and grace. Their sister eek pity, mercy ministered wines of temperance, grace shed high liquor of good governance and. Pity proffered with full good poison, wines of comfort and consolation. The wine of mercy stauncheth by nature, the greedy thirsts of cruel hasteness. Grace with the high liquor, crystalline and pure, deferreth vengeance of furious woodness. And pity blimpseth the sword of right wiseness, convenable wells, most wholesome of savour. For it to be tasted of every governor. Oh, how these wells, whoso take good heed, with here liquor is most wholesome to attain. A four device notably indeed, for to accord with the mayor's name, which by report of his worthy fame, that they was busy in all his governance unto the king for to done pleasance. There were eke treen with leaves fresh of hue, all time of year full of fruits laid of color heavenly and airy like new oranges almonds and the pomegranate uh, lemons dates their colors fresh and glad pippins quinces blondrel to the sport and the pomegranate cur courage courageous to recomfort eat the fruits which were which more common be queenings peaches costards and mordens and other meaningful <laughs> And other mean, other meaningful, fair and fresh to see, the palm palm water and the gentle recardens and against hearts for mutigations, you think, and against hearts for mutigation stamens, which were here taste delight, for great play of both of black and white, and besides this gracious paradise, all joy and gladness for to multiply, two old men, full circumspect and wise. There did appear like folks of fer fairy, fairy. The one was Enoch, the other Eli, Eli. The king presenting their gifts, full notable that God confirm his state eye to be stable. The first said with benign cheer, greatly desiring his prosperity, that no enemies have in him power, nor that no child by his false iniquity perturbable never his felicity. Thus old Enoch, the process can well tell, and prayed for the king as he rude by the well. After Elias, with his looks hoar, said well devoutly looking on the king, God conserve thee, and keep thee evermore, and make him blessed here in earth living, and preserve him in all manner thing, and specially amongst kings all, in enemies' hands that he never fall. And at fronter of these wells clear, there was a scripture commanding the liquor. Ye shall draw waters with good cheer out of the wells of our Saviour, which have virtue to cure an all languor by influence of her great sweetness, hearts avoiding of all their heaviness. <laughs> then from these wells of fulsome abundance, with their liquors as any crystal clean, the king rode forth with sober countenance towards a castle built of jasper green, upon whose towers the sun shone sheen. There clearly showed by notable countenance this king's title of England and of France. Two green trees there grew upright from St. Edward and from 
St. Lawis, the druid I take palpable to the sight, conveyed by lines be kings of by kings of great pris. Some bore leopards and some bore fleur de lis. Uh, in I, neither arms found was there no lack, which the sixth Harry may now bear on his back. And we'll pass over to Rachel as we get into the uh, depictions of, shall we say, pedigree of the of the king. Uh, seems to be what's going on here. A bit of uh, uh, heraldry in action. The pedigree be just succession, as true chronicles truly determine. Unto the king is now descended down from either party right as any line, upon whose head now freshly done shine two rich crowns most sovereign of pleasance to bring in peace between England and France. Upon this castle on the other side, there was a tree which sprang out of Jesse, ordained of God full long to abide, David crowned first for his humility, the branches conveyed as men might see linearly and in the genealogy to Christ Jesu that was born of Mary. And why the Jesse was set on that party, this was the cause in especial. For next to Paul's, I dare well specify, is the party most chief and principal called of London, the church cathedral, which ought of reason the device to excuse to all though that would again it frown or muse. And fro that castle the king forth gan him dress toward Paul's chief church of this city and at conduit a light and a likeness indivisible made of the Trinity, a throne compassed of his royal sea, about which shortly to conclude of heavenly angels were a great multitude to whom was governed a press precept in scripture to whom was govern a precept in scripture, writ in the frontier of the high stage, that they should done their best cure to keep the king from all damage. In his life here, during all his age, his high renown to spread and shine far, and of his two realms to cease the mortal war. And last was written in the fronters, I shall fulfil him with joy and abundance, and with length of wholesome years, and I shall show him my help with all pleasance, and of his lieges faithful obeisance, and multiply and increase his line, and make his nobleness through the world to shine. Love of his people, favour of all strangers, in both his realms peace, rest and unity, by influence of the nine spheres, a uh, spears, long to continue in his royal sea, Grace to min cherish the mayor and the city, long in his mind to be conceived, with how good will that day he was received. Coming to Paul's, there he lit a down, entering the church full demure of cheer, and there to meet him with procession was the archbishop and the chancellor, Lincoln and Bath of whole heart and entire, Salisbury, Norwich, and Ely, in pontifical arrayed richly. There was the Bishop of Rochester also, the Dean of Paul's, the canons everyone, of duty as they ought to do, on procession with the King to gone. And though I cannot rehearse them one by one, yet dare I say, as in their intent, to do their devour full truly they meant. And Liza, like their can, estates you, Liza can you pick up the, uh, the thread from there? Like their estates, forth they gan proceed with observances longing for a longing for a king. Solemnly gan him convey, indeed, up into the church with full devout singing. And when he had made his offering, the mayor, the citizens abode and left him not until Westminster till they had him brought, where all the co the covent in copes richly met met with him as of custom they ought. The abbot, after most solemnly amongst the relics, the scepter outsought of St. Edward, and to the king it brought. Though it were long, large, and of great weight, yet on his shoulders the king bare it on height into the minster, while all the bells rung, till he come to the high altar, and full devoutly Te Deum there was sung. And the people, glad of look and cheer, thanked God with all their hearts entire to see their king with two crowns shine, 
from two trees truly fet the line. And after that, this is the very sooth, unto his palace of kingly apparel with his lords the king forth goeth to take his rest after his travail. And then of wisdom that may so much avail, the mayor, the citizens, which all this did see, been home repaired into their city. The shreves, the aldermen in fear, the Saturday, the Saturday author next suing, the Saturday after next suing, their mayor presented with their hearts entire goodly to be received of the king. And at Westminster confirmed their asking, the mayor and they with full hold intent unto the king a gift gan to present. The which gift they goodly have disposed took an hamper of gold that sheen shone a thousand pound of gold therein enclosed. Therewithal to the king they gone and fell on knees to forn him every one, full humbly the truth to devise, and to the king the mayor said in this wise, most Christian prince and noble king, the good folk of your most noble, notable city of London, otherwise clipped your chamber, beseeching in here most lowly wise they may be recommended to your highness, and that it can like unto your noble grace to receive this little gift, given with a good will of truth and lowness, as ever any gift was given to any earthly prince. And Angelo, if you can take up the, uh, the last uh, uh, bit, as it were. Be glad, O London, be glad and make great joy. City of cities, of noblest preselling, in thy beginning called New Troy. For worthiness, thank God of all thing, which hast this day received so thy king, with many a sign and many an observance to increase thy name by new remembrance. Such joy was never in the consistory, made for the triumph with all the surplusage. When Caesar Julius came home with his victory, nay for the conquest of Scipion in Carthage, as London made in <clears throat> every manner age out of France at the homecoming into this city of their noble king. <clears throat> of seven things I praise this city, of true meaning and faithful observance, of right wiseness, truth and equity of stableness I kept in legions, and for a virtue thou hast such sufficience in this land here and other lands all, the king's chamber of custom men thee call. O noble mayor, be it unto your pleasance and to all that dwell in this city, on my rudeness and on my ignorance of grace and mercy for to have pity, my simple making for to get, take agree, Consider this, that in most lowly wise my will were good for do, to do you service. End of text. Lots of stuff. They go to St. Paul's. Uh, there are, there are, there's a castle along the way. There are trees. There's fruit around the tree. There's fruits and all sorts of lovely smelling things, I'm sure. It must be all about smells, uh, if it's fresh or or something like that. It might just be that it looks lovely and it's all fake. Um, and they collect all the clergy at St. Paul's and they go to Westminster for additional stuff. There's bells, there's uh, Te Deum is sung. Um, it's quite a day. It's quite a day. Um, I was just thinking about the route a bit more because um, they start over at Blackheath, uh, I think. Um, I'm sure that got mentioned earlier. I don't think anyone mentions boats, so I'm assuming that they cross over the bridge on horseback. Um, so they're approaching from the south into the city, um, and then and then they basically, yeah, work their way along Cheapside to St Paul's, and then they head off to Westminster again, presumably on horseback as well. Um, I may be inferring some of that. I might be 100% certain on that. Um, but thoughts on the room, if I'm horribly wrong. A uh, lot, lot of number sevens, I think, has been noted. Threes and sevens. There's a lot of them. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Much more engaged with this than the other stuff, I have to say. But that's because we've been doing a lot of this stuff. Uh, Rachel. Maybe, maybe... Um three for that you know holy trinity of the of uh god jesus the holy spirit 
and then the seven for uh aren't there like seven virtues or something the ones that are supposed to be a, the, a, against the deadly sins or something maybe yep. is that the repetition of these numbers yeah absolutely absolutely i think it's all of that um is is, is there um yeah, there's heraldry, and there's an awful lot of Isn't London Great at the end as well. Huge amounts of Isn't London Great, um, um, and uh, as well as, you know, Isn't It Great, you're, we've got a king in London, um, but Isn't London Great. Uh, final thoughts from the room, because we, we've, we've gone long, we've packed a lot of text in. We've packed a lot of text in. Um, I have to say, I, I really enjoyed the triumphal entry. Um, I think there's a lot more to unpack from that. I think, like all of these kinds of texts, it's unhelpful in so many ways because so much of it is here is a description. Here is a description of the weather, um, you know. And this, you know, it, it wasn't. It was. It was a nice day. It, it could have been awful weather, but it was. It was lovely weather. And it's like all of these outdoor events is this constant em emphasis on the weather and uh, for those of us who've lived through a, L uh, a lord mayor show we know the reason for that uh, it's because it's so weather dependent there is no there is nowhere to hide so um there's that um uh, uh there's a lot of interest in uh, of unpacking the disguisings how much of that is actual proper text and how much of that is something slightly different um i'm i'm not wholly convinced as to how performative that was designed to be or how much that is a reworking of things for later reading i don't know uh thoughts on the room about that and obviously the the terrifying comic strip that we opened with um <laughs> uh, and things yeah final thoughts eric any final thoughts about lydgate and what we've been sort of staggering through here um pomegranates um <laughs> sorry i just <laughs> I was incoming. Trying to read, take cover. Yeah, I don't know. Just trying to read that while, like, sort of my eyes were going. I don't know what this word is. He's been blinded um, with vitamin C. No. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> just um, it sounds like the sort of civic pageantry part that we did was um very sort of rich in terms of textures. You've got like the fruits. You've got the smells. You've got yeah, you know, the costumes to look at. You've got various things, um, and there was a part of me going, "I'm glad we don't have to try and you know reconstruct that because that would be very expensive." <laughs> and also, I don't know how many of these fruits would exist at, at this point in in time, um, and also the horses and antelopes and all that stuff. Yeah, the disappointing number of animals. I was hoping for more animals. There really wasn't enough animals. I, you know, we got two antelopes, and that was about it. And they might not have been literal anyway. Um, there's, there's, again, there's all these heraldic stuff that it might just be painted on on surfaces. Uh, I want big, giant, giant stuffed animal things. That's what I want. Um, that's what I'm here for. Um, yeah, oh, I have to say, as, as an audio uh, thing, I think we can do we can do a good job with the triumphal entry. I think we can turn that into a thing. Um, that that really excites me. Um, you, but you're right; there's no way in hell we're trying to restage it. Uh, <laughs> we'd have yeah. to shut down the whole of London. It's it's not going to happen. I uh, mean, we can dream, right? We, we can dream. Yeah. I think a lovely animation is probably about as far as we could go uh, with that in a practical way. Uh, but. And I think that's that's a, a medium to long term goal that I think is perfectly plausible. Um, Angela, any any final thoughts from you? I, totally outside your period, um, but oddly interesting future connection echo things. No, that's right. It's kind of interesting to see what's there and the things that last, you know, for a very long time. Um, so I'm interested in this. Um, like miscellany of uh, of things. I mean, are they in a document together or I mean, because they're, they're, they're two of them are on a similar topic and then the other one is is something completely different. And also the pageant reads, you know, really, really clearly, um, which the other two have got. I mean, I often think it's because of jokes, which means that it makes it just harder. <laughs> you know. So I just wondered what what how did they come together, these things? I do not off the top of my head know its textual history. There will be one, um, and it will be lengthy and complicated. Um, 
uh, or, or not, or they'll just be all in a, a single role that exists somewhere. But uh, off the top of my head, I do not know. Um, um, yes, that is the answer to your question. <laughs> But I'm sure someone out there does, and we will get there, uh, especially as we have more Lydgate or Lydgate-ish material to do um, as we, we dig a little further into things. Uh, Rachel, any final thoughts? Um, I really enjoyed the last one. Uh, uh, I, I, the, all the fruits and stuff that were named, I wonder if this, uh, uh, you know, because these must all be exotic fruits, you know, from the conversation we're having in chat and the talk about the lemons and stuff like that. Uh, if because he's bringing home uh, a queen from France, that that has something to do with it about this, you know, that there's a sort of international outward look like like in this, you know, and the things that it'll, that it it's, will bring to the to England. Um, uh, the, I don't think he's bringing a queen across for a while yet. I think that's uh, that's that's the later royal entry. Uh, I think is uh, is 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 that. If, uh, apologies for missing. Never mind then. Uh, but certainly, yes, they they are semi exotic in the sense that you know that they, they, they do not grow well in an English climate, especially an English climate then, which would probably have been slightly worse than it is now. Um, I'm not quite sure in relation to the mini ice age we are with uh, with the climate but it's probably a little it's it's it is probably co colder um we, we had something of a dip uh, climate wise um uh liza if you're still there uh do you have any final thoughts um sorry i didn't realize that i had disappeared um i just slipped into another dimension uh there was so a lot of fruit. So easily done. So easily done. Um, well, I, I'm also uh, relishing the the scraps of physical history we have, the places in London, uh, as everyone else was saying, the the list of fruit and and what was considered luxurious at this time and what was considered common. Um, because I love that they make that distinction. I like that they they distinguish between the luxury fruits. Uh, and the and the fruits that um, that everyone knows about, um, and I would, you know, it. I would love to run down the rabbit hole of what's what's available at this time. But, you know, it's just little flourishes like that, which are meant, I think, to give the air of luxury, and to and to give and to also delight the sense of taste of the reader, rather like the wine. Um, to, to say this isn't just a feast for the eyes and the prose isn't just a feast for the the ears but it's also a feast for all the senses um, they don't they don't mention scent I guess but you know London in 1532 probably can't have been that pleasant smelling a place I guess maybe they had incense when they got to St Paul's um, so yeah all of I mean for uh, for a monk, John Lydgate had quite a colorful sense he, of, of worldly, worldly things. You know, he writes uh, misogynistically, but with a certain sense of humor about relationships. Uh, he seems to take great pleasure in describing these monsters that eat, that will eat your spouse. Um, and, uh, and the... Um, the poem, the, the, the royal entry, although it reads like an, it reads a bit like an official commission, mm. but it's nicely written and nicely phrased and it rolls along um, and very better well. Than, it's better than Thomas Haywood. Um, let's, 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 let's put it that way. <laughs> well, the ghost of Haywood might want to just up and punch the ghost of Lydgate, but we'll, oh, we'll all be spectators at that death match. Uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, having just read through it, and uh, I was just going, so presumably they went over the bridge. I don't remember the bridge, apart from the several pa paragraphs of bridge stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing how much one forgets almost instantly upon reading. It was even text I actually read aloud, so that was good. That's good. It shows I'm paying attention. Um, yes, they definitely went over the bridge. Right, okay. Um, uh, any additional thoughts before I close the session? Um, no? 
Well, then, all that remains is to thank all these wonderful readers for all their, their wonderful patience uh, reading the, some stuff, which is sometimes a bit trying. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. And uh, my final line, wine is a liquor of recreation. Take that home with you and, and, and live with it. <laughs>